Okay, maybe I'll turn this on. Please take your seats. We'll be starting right now. So first, thank you for being here this evening. I am the vice president of the Fandom Club, and as such, I'm quite excited to be hosting this together yes. with student government. It's, it's a prop talk that we've been very excited about if you've heard about Fandom before. It's, it's a club of quite the, um, the dark horse of clubs just started, started a year ago, but we've been quite invested in communities and fan bases uh, around any kind of topic, any kind of TV series and, and book series, uh, such as the topic of tonight's lecture. And uh, Harry Potter definitely had a very important place in fandom's heart. We've hosted a couple of events about it, and we've had a sorting ceremony uh, hosted here in the Alemania. So we've, we've definitely had this in mind as a, possibly the best kind of talk. Uh, and we're really happy that <laughs> we're really happy that uh, tonight we get to discuss also the academic and the other nuances of such such uh, such an important part of a lot of our community here at GCU. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you with uh, Alessandra Grego, our professor here, and hosting Harry Potter and the Barbarian Horde. Um, so I'm marginally horrified, and over the last week, an increasing horror of what I'd undertaken to do this evening in discussing Harry Potter's taken possession of me, and I fully expect the most awful consequences as a result of this act of hubris. Um, <laughs> hubris means today something, da some, something like dangerous overconfidence, uh, but the Encyclopedia Britannica entry gives us overweening presumption that leads a person to disregard the divinely fixed limits on human action in an ordered cosmos. It goes on to point out that Aristotle considered young men and the rich hubristic because they think they are better than other people. As I am neither a young man or rich, and I am not at all sure that we do live in an ordered cosmos, maybe I'll get off scot-free We'll see. But what led me to tackle this dangerous topic? I offered to give this talk after the meeting of the Academic Senate with the student government at the beginning of this term on an impulse. I do a lot of things on an impulse, and I don't recommend it. And as a reaction to the impassioned call to professors to interact with the students out of the classroom on topics of shared interest. I offered to talk about Harry Potter because I am so grateful for its existence. The Harry Potter novels have provided me with a commonly shared text from which I could draw endless examples to illustrate concepts of plot, characterization, realism, fantasy, suspension of disbelief, point of view, story world, narrative systems, to mention only a few, as my students know. Um, for an English literature instructor, this is really invaluable. Also, ever since I binge read the whole series over a few weeks in September 2008, I have had great respect for and appreciation of these novels. The fact that I binge read is no indication of quality in itself, as every binger knows. But after years of reading literature of every kind, I have at least developed the ability to understand whether I am reacting positively to a text because it is easy to understand and unpretentiously enjoyable, like salad, <laughs> because it is manipulative and controlling, like chocolate, or because it is soul nourishing and thought provoking. No food comparison here. <laughs> Only literature does this for me. Most usefully, even while I am enjoying the binge, I do notice whether the text is shoddy, using trite tropes, implying overused and unimaginative characterization, cheap plotting devices, etc. I don't mean I won't read such a text, but I will notice. And in 2008, I didn't notice. I just enjoyed reading, particularly admiring the ability with which J.K. Rowling had consistently kept to a single point of view, constructing a convincing development for, for Harry, whose understanding expanded as the story progressively became darker with elements that were convincingly presented as having always been present in the story world, but not apparent to Harry himself. 
My daughter started reading Harry Potter when she was seven in 2012. For the following seven years, she has read one Harry Potter a year. And when she had finished reading the novel, she watched the movie. She refused to read more than one a year, not the binger. I thought we might read it together, and she said no. <laughs> she wanted to read it on her own. So left to my own devices, I reread the whole seven novels in a few weeks in September of 2012, and enjoyed them again. After my rash proposition to the student government this January, panicking, I reread all seven of the novels. And they still seem good to me. So this is where I stand in relation to Harry Potter. I have read the seven novels three times. I have watched all the movies, and the two movies in the Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them series. I have not read the Cursed Child um, script or any fan fiction. I am by no means, and let me stress this, an expert. So what am I going to talk to you about? Let me explain my title, Who is the Barbarian Horde? So, this is the OED definition of barbaric. Okay, so etymologically, a foreigner, one whose language and customs differ from the speakers. That's pretty straightforward. It comes just from the sound they made, if you couldn't understand. Historical. A person who is not a Greek. A person living outside the pale of the Roman Empire and its civilization, applied especially to the northern nations that overthrew them. A person who is outside the pale of Christian civilization, with the Italians of the Renaissance, a member outside of Italy. So I think you're getting a point here. Finally, a rude, wild, uncivilized person, sometimes distinguished from savage, an uncultured person, or one who has no sympathy with literary culture. As you can see, barbarian is a relative term, always used to define those who do not belong to our group, but are at our gates, trying to get in. People who do not share our group's traditions, but who are peacefully minding their own business on the other side of the planet, we do not call barbarians. A barbarian horde is Thus, a large number of threatening and frightening people who are battering their way into our well-ordered space with the aim of altering it irremediably, if not destroying it entirely. So again, who are the barbarians for the purposes of this talk? So there are three possibilities. This is possibility number one. The Harry Potter fans trying to break into the ivory tower of English literary fiction, claiming their favorite novels should have a place in the canon. Number, sorry. Yeah. Number two, the media corporations who have broken into the sacred space of Harry Potter readers and transformed the cherished stories into a soulless media franchise. Number three, the fan fiction authors who are testing the bulwarks of authorship and copyright. This is what I'm going to be talking about. Where are the barbarians? Should we fear the barbarians? In 2000, the New York Times was forced to institute a children's literature category to allow some variation to its famous bestseller list. This was before the release of the first Harry Potter film in 2001, and coincided with the publication of The Goblet of Fire, the fourth book in the series, and the first for which an elaborate launch strategy was organized, when effectively Harry Potter went from success to phenomenon. This is where we are today. Harry Potter, as the Pottermore site itself is happy to announce, has sold to date 500 million copies, which actually sounds a lot, but you would be surprised how many people have sold 300 million, I was surprised. It's really not an indication of anything other than a lot of people have bought a copy of Harry Potter. So it's an indication of that, but we have to be careful of what we deduce from that. It has been translated into 80 languages. This, to me, is more interesting. Um, a media franchise has um, spinned off from it, which is worth billions. 
We can certainly see, see that the nut was associated to Harry Potter drove some academics and novelists to their desks to rebuff the barbarian advance. I don't know to what extent there was an actual demand for Harry Potter to be considered on a par with the avowed classics of children's literature such as Alice in Wonderland or of fantasy such as the works of Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. I don't know to what extent that demand was coming from the readers. I expect that those readers were perfectly happy just to get on with reading their texts without worrying whether they belong, where they belonged in the canon. But it is evident that the self-proclaimed gatekeepers of literary fiction felt it incumbent on them to announce to the world that these barbarians would not pass. This is how they explained why Harry Potter would not let, be let into the canon, even if the subgenre, into the subgenre of fantasy canon, which itself had only recently and tentatively been admitted to the group of literary fiction. So this is Harold Bloom. Can 35 million book buyers, mind you, not readers, be wrong? Yes. One can reasonably doubt that Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone sorry, is going to prove a classic of children's literature. But Rowling, whatever the aesthetic weaknesses of her work, is at least a millennial index to our popular culture. So huge an audience gives her importance akin to rock stars, movie idols, TV anchors, and successful politicians. Her prose style, heavy on cliche, makes no demands on her readers. In an arbitrarily chosen single page, page four of the first Harry Potter book, I count seven cliches, all of the stretch, his legs, variety. Harry Potter and the Tigerish Adult, A. S. Byatt, July 7, 2003. Mind you that this is around the years 2000. The series is not finished, the films have not finished. Ms. Rowling's magic world has no place for numinous. It is written for people whose imaginative lives are confined to TV cartoons and the exaggerated, more exciting, not threatening mirror worlds of soaps, reality TV, and celebrity gossip. Its values and everything in it are, as Gatsby said, of his own world when the light had gone out of his dream, only personal. Nobody is trying to save or destroy anything beyond Harry Potter and his friends and family. And finally, in my short list of examples, Harry Potter's big con is the prose from 2007. It is time to make a stand against Harry Potter, a futile stand, no death or glory involved. Just popping my head over the trenches so it can be mowed off by the vast, unstoppable juggernaut of popular acclaim before I have began to open my mouth. So he is definitely anticipating some barbarian reaction. And he's also kind of visually imagining that he is literally, like, he's kind of behind the wall, right? He's going to pop over it and people are going to knock his head off. So I'm not going to read the rest of it. I'm just going to leave it there. You can read it. But what we can see is. Um, the numbers, um, sorry, lost my place entirely. What we can see is that the principal argument that is made against Harry Potter is the popularity. Also the fact that Harry Potter is a children's book. This works against the text because it suggests that it has a very low level of access, that it is simple prose, that it is pedestrian, because it doesn't have the inventiveness of Alice in Wonderland. The indication that it is not only children who are reading Harry Potter further works against it, because adults are expected to graduate from the genre of fantasy as they grow older. This implies that Harry Potter is a sign of the way mass culture has infantilized adults, making them incapable of dealing with the complexities of adult literature. And yet at the same time as these self-proclaimed defenders of the canon, Harold Bloom is the author of the Western canon, um, a search of the MLA International Bibliography shows the, uh, that academia is actually taking an interest and an increasing interest in Harry Potter. Academic publications travel at an ent entirely different speed from other forms of publication, and it is quite usual for an article to take minimum of two years from submission to publication. And yet, for a text published between 1997 and 2007, Harry Potter has a very respectable number, number of academic titles associated to it. As you can not see here, because it is too small, but just take my word for it. <laughs> um, but, uh, this is 
compared, uh, and uh, this was an idea that I got from uh, my friend uh, Maria Laura Gandolfo, it's compared to the Goodreads ratings. And the, the MLA uh, uh, list of papers for each novel is in the tens, and the Goodreads ratings is in the millions. But they look the same. And what do I mean by this? That it's obviously much easier to make a rating on good reads. Like, in fact, as I looked yesterday and today, there are more ratings. Okay, so like it takes 24 hours to increase the ratings. To write a text, an article on something, it takes much longer. And the fact is that it respects the pattern of the popularity. But there's a better indicator of the fact that Harry Potter is actually being considered actively by academia and not negatively. And that is, um, uh, if we look, because actually the MLA uh, 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 Bibliographic Index works better with authors than it does with titles. So if you search for authors, you'll see that there is um, a quite a respectable figure of um, uh, texts, which could be very different kinds of texts that are dealing with Harry Potter uh, in the uh, 800s, 850 more or less, compared to, uh, for instance, The Lord of the Rings, which is a lot older. And so that means that in the same amount of time, it, I'm sorry, in a different amount of time, it has made quite, a, quite um, fast progress. I mean, this is inevitable. Harry Potter is a big part of co contemporary culture, and academia must take notice of it. What I want to point out here is that academia does quietly, at its own rhythm, take note of it and do all the studies that are necessary to be done, but there are very loud-speaking people who have taken it upon themselves to say, no, we don't like this, go away. And they are tell saying this against a, an undefined group of people. It's not clear who they're writing for or to or against. So the question is, and has been, this is another thing of the same. This, the question is, and has been now for a long time, whether this argument is useful or constructive. It becomes prominent as soon as the uncultured masses create a space for what is called the culture industry. Whether there is such a thing as high and low culture, whether it makes sense to differentiate between that what the majority of the population enjoys and the cultural products that appeal to a limited subgroup, whether the difference is a matter of taste, of education, of politics, of economics, are questions that academia should consider. But on the other hand, there is also a contention, which as the teapot in Disney's Beauty and the Beast would say, is as old as time. To go back less than 500 years, for instance, we find Robert Greene, member of the University Wits, with Christopher Marlowe and um, Sir Walter Raleigh, writing a pamphlet against the extremely successful William Shakespeare, who had not been to university, calling him an upstart crow and a jack of all trades, with a tiger's heart who is playing dirty by doubling as writer and actor. Actors were more powerful than writers at the time as they controlled the theatres. Now, this has kind of gone on record as just a case of envy, effectively. Um, and that is sometimes the tendency that we have with any criticism of extremely popular things. But we want to consider it a little more seriously, at least that's what I'm proposing to do today. So, this contention um, continued as of 500 years ago to become particularly fierce. Um, in direct proportion to the rise of democracy and the spreading of the reading public. The more people were reading, the more people were educated, the more and the fiercer that this defense became. And it is um, an argument that is further complicated at the turn of the 20th century when the influence of capitalism on culture is analyzed by the Frankfurt School, who argue that capitalism has created a culture industry. So this is my second barbarian horde that we are, I pointed out earlier. The second barbarian horde is the culture industry itself. So let's assume, which is not the case, but I wouldn't be surprised if it were shortly to be the case, that Harry Potter has been accepted and is considered a classic of children's literature, fantasy, or whatever, right? So like it will maybe find its own genre as it is in the bestsellers list of, um, um, you know, altering the best-selling list of um, uh, the New York Times. If this is the case, what does the construction of a media franchise around the Harry Potter text do to the text itself? The media franchise is massive. 
including the movies, the theme parks, the sequels, uh, and even this most recent edition called A Story Coaster. Um, so basically what this is, it's in the theme park in Orlando and it's a roller coaster technically, but they've called all the artists of the original Harry Potter series and they've made them recreate all the scariest monsters and so you, you have an experience of, you know, and I'm sure it's a world of fun. <coughs> I don't know. I mean, I like roller coasters. I don't really like it when people force stories down my throat, so I'm on the fence about that one. Um, it is, the Harry Potter franchise is now competing directly with story worlds like Star Wars that have been going on since 1977. And it's also a rather different case because the Star Wars, as a carefully, uh, sorry, as a careful study of what is acceptable to its viewers, has been working on basically traditional narrative carefully constructed with the aid of Joseph Campbell's hero's journey to work as a universal narrative. Now this isn't, I mean, this is widely attested by different fronts, including George Lucas himself, right? So he was looking for something that would work on a very large scale. And what is the innovation of Star Wars? It's in the medium of expression, it's in the cinema, I know um, Professor Mayolini gave you a lecture on this, in the relocation of the narrative, so in future in space, but not necessarily in the elements of the story. As soon as there is an attempt to develop in the uh, complexity, uh, by which I mean depth and stratification of character and other aspects, for instance, backstories, as George Lucas tried to do in Star Wars 1, 2, and 3, the text doesn't really sustain that completely. It works better when it is, being, when it is using its own tropes in different settings with um, variations that are kind of along the horizontal line of narrative as opposed to working in depth. What complexity the Star Wars story world has lies very much, and this is a very important thing Star Wars does, for the culture industry in the work of its fan base. What Star Wars presents us with is not a single text, but, it, but the gradual structuring of a text over years and by multiple different authors. It works like, um, for, I mean, just to draw a higher law comparison, the Commedia dell'arte. Uh, it used, there used to be a Camelaccio, so called. Sorry. This was um, the story was, uh, sorry, the hero's journey of, um, of uh, uh, Joseph Campbell. And this is the Commedia in Life. But there was a Canovaccio. So there's top characters, a Canovaccio, and actors had the ability to riff off that. They would be able to create within the characters' roles different scenarios and settings. This is actually pretty amazing to see in the 20th century. Why so? Because it is doing something interesting with authorship. Um, which tended to become a little more rigid over the, um, uh, you know, in the post-Gutenberg era. So an outline of story and characters is very important. But in Harry Potter, we don't have an outline. In Harry Potter, we have seven volumes, which actually compose a single novel, because that's what it is, right? The story doesn't end until the seventh installment. Uh, we have types that are extremely recognizable, but also quite stratified. They are, they are complicated. Um, when it is made into a film, it is made into a film as a fully narrated text. It already exists entirely, not only in the text, that's quite frequent, they're frequently making films out of um, and novels that pre-existed, but in the minds and in the imagination of an enormous quantity of readers who are the reason why this book sped so fast into becoming a film. So this is a completely different relationship uh, from what Star Wars has with its, uh, uh, with its um, uh, viewers. Even though the Star Wars fans participate in the, in the universe of Star Wars, Harry Potter the readers of Harry Potter and J.K. Rowling, and there's a debate about that, own the story before it becomes a film. 
and they wouldn't have stand, stood for 25 seconds any variation, even those variations which are compulsory, you know, they are necessary because you are changing a film, a, a novel that is extremely long, as people have put out, put, uh, pointed out, they get increasingly thick, the volumes, into two hours, four hours for the final version of Deathly Hallows, there's so much that needs to be cut, that generates enormous complaints, okay? So this pattern of authorship has entirely changed. So Harry Potter comes to the film, not only as a fully working narrative and consequently a, a narrative that has to be respected, but also the visual media ages at a different speed than the text which means that although all the technological developments that have been brought into making this film into what it is, and they are pretty amazing, and CGI is, uh, I'm particularly uh, an extreme fan of CGI, it is still the case that the makers of the movies face the problem of having to compete with the reader's imagination. Literature has a great advantage over movies and fantasy, that the extent to which it works is directly proportionate to the talent of the writer and the imaginative ability of the reader. While in film, it depends on the technological possibilities of the developing special effects team. The talent of the writer is a technical ability, a skill with words used in such a way as to create worlds that are entirely believable, although entirely fictional, even when they are very different or distant from the reader's experience. This was the problem in the movie The Ten Commandments. I don't know if you've ever seen the scene in which, um, of the opening of the uh, seas, right? That is a scene that is in the imagination of even more readers than the readers of Harry Potter. And yet, I mean, that is completely underwhelming. And it's not underwhelming for any other reason that they didn't have the technological ability to make it different. If Jurassic Park doesn't look like it is actually populated by live dinosaurs, you're not going to believe it. But if you read a novel in which there are dinosaurs, you're fine. And that is another point in which the competition might be problematic. It's good that CGI develops to catch up with the imagination of the reader, but then what happens? Can we think out of CGI? Can we create our own monsters? The technical limitations of special effects pose limits to the potential for the storytelling of film, which is why, as Professor Magali discussed in the last professor talk, George, George Lucas develops a whole special effects industry, the Industrial Lights and Magic Company in 1975 to service his own and other films. Pixar starts a CGI company and only later starts producing its own animation. CGI makes telling a Harry Potter possible in a way that it will not disappoint the readers. It makes the magic narratable in visual terms. And this is very powerful and effective and the viewers are extremely charmed by the result and so the question remains. And it is a question that the Potter fans themselves ask themselves. Is the media industry, is the, are the films, the merchandise, the theme parks, the rides helping or exploiting Harry Potter? Is it frustrating their imagination of the readers and the fans with the spectacular effects of CGI? And this might be the problem posed by Harry Potter. It is children's fiction that has jumped its categorical container, leaped out of its genre boundaries. When first published, The Philosopher's Stone was very much praised and prized as children's literature. But as it gradually invaded other categories, as it appeared to be unstoppable, a juggernaut, it was called, as you recall, um, and horror to be read by adults, then it was found not to be good enough, challenging enough, intellectual enough to be dominating over all that more sophisticated literature. Consequently, the assumption was that it was a sick manifestation of the debauched and anti-intellectual times we are living in. Adults had finally been infantilized by the culture industry who had, who had the reader just where it wanted it, and especially the viewer, sitting quietly next to the sports fan, the moviegoer, the music fan, waiting for the next dose of artificial art or industrial art. But novels actually occupy a strange position in the culture industry because they don't cost as much as a movie or a sports event to produce. 
not counting the effort of the author, which costs a lot but isn't monetized, and don't generate anything as much as like as much revenue compared to the film industry or the sports industry or the music industry. Not even Harry Potter the novel generates as much money as Harry Potter the film. Also, literature is an awkward product for mass consumption. It does not yield immediate pleasure. You have to read it. It takes a certain amount of time to get through the words, which is a longer amount of time than even the longer feature films, or the longer sports events, or the longest concert. That time factor has made literature into a different kind of product with its own specific form of consumption. Um, Marcuse famously states that the truth of art lies in its power to break the monopoly of established reality to define what is real. This seems reasonable to me. I'm sure he'll be happy to hear that. Um, so if a work of art is good enough, it will change our perspective and open our eyes. But Marcuse himself points out that the co-opting of the work of art by the culture industry translates art into a product which neutralizes its power to change reality. And so the difficulty lies in getting independent art to the people who are the victims of the cultural industry monopoly and of the single story. The tendency of the cultural industry to produce the same limited narratives is not good for art. The restriction of narratives to a single story, I am going to call it a monomyth, which is what Joseph Campbell calls the hero's journey. I don't like the hero's journey. I don't believe in the hero's journey. I think there are an infinite quantity of other journeys to be narrated. But the culture industry does like the hero's journey and tends to ram it repeatedly down our throats. That is known Whatever is known to be accepted by the public is already familiar, even when it changes minimally, effectively, must produce a deathly repetition. The fear of a monopoly in culture that will only follow the market unimaginatively is echoed by Raymond Williams, who suggests that the movement towards visions of universalism is much more evident in cultural media. The press, the cinema, the broadcasting and the sports than in those of traditional philosophy and arts. And yet it is becoming universal only in the sense that it is widely exported from a few powerful centers within radically unequal terms of exchange. What does this mean? That if there is only a group of people telling that one story, that story is always going to be the same story. It doesn't matter how many people read it. And it doesn't matter how many people watch the movies. If it is only coming from one source, it's only going to be one story. The only way to have lots of different stories is to have lots of different sources. And to anticipate where I'm going with this, there is a way of telling lots of different stories, and that is myth. Richard Rorty said, only a society without politics, that is to say a society run by tyrants who prevent social and cultural change from occurring, would not require philosophers. In societies where there is no politics, philosophers can only be priests in the service of a state religion. In free societies, there will always be a need for their services, for such societies never stop changing, and hence never stop making old vocabularies obsolete. This applies also following the argument um, uh, that we've been making to artists. In a society where there is no possible social and cultural change, artists can only be priests in the service of the same religion. By making old vocabularies obsolete, sorry, um, by endlessly repeating the single story, but artists are those who transform tyrannies into free societies by making old vocabularies obsolete but also by renovating old vocabularies, reworking them, owning them, resetting them, tying them apart, putting them back, back together again, and doing whatever they want with them. As Marcuse says, finally, I finished quoting people, art doesn't change the world, but it may change the consciousness of people. Oh, maybe I didn't have that. No, um, I got fed up myself with all the quotations I was reading. But it, it doesn't change, the, I'll just read it, it doesn't change the world, but it makes changes to the consciousness of people who can then change the world. It's slower than a revolution. It kind of, you know, you don't storm the city and take it down, 
but it works. We know it to work. We've seen it work. It's just that we have to have a kind of slightly longer vision. So the final barbarian fan, uh, group is fan fiction. And fan fictions, according to me, are the barbarians that are going to save us because there are saviors amongst the barbarians. So if we go back a moment, the idea, if you're born in Athens a few thousand years ago and believe that either you are autochthonous, born of the land itself, or you are a barbarian, anything different from you is wrong. If you are a citizen of the Roman Empire in 376, of the common era, and you are seriously concerned by the recurring invasions of the barbarians, which will finally lead to the, which are leading to the decline, and will finally lead to the fall of the Roman Empire, that has so colonized our imagination, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire is part of everybody's kind of fear, there's repeated manifestations of it all over the place all the time. Barbarians are destroyers of civilization. They have no ability to understand the value of what is before them, and they will set back history by a thousand years, so you do not want to let them in. However, another point of view is that barbarians rejuvenate the system, interrupt the single narrative, offer new perspectives, integrate and multiplicate stories. These are the kind of barbarians that fan fiction writers are, and I don't think this in the same way as the literary agent of um, J.K. Rowling thought it, when um, J.K. Rowling decided that she should not sue fan fiction but support it at one point, I think very wisely, but she made a deal that that fan fiction would only be non-profit and only be online, so people will print it, but it shouldn't be officially published. Um, also that it shouldn't have pornography. Um, but what the literary agent said was that writing fan fiction could be a way for writers to develop and start writing their own fiction, right? Fiction in their own right. But what does that even mean? What it, why is writing what is called derivative fiction? If you remember at the beginning of this talk, that is the accusation that is leveled by academia against J.K. Rowling herself, that she is writing derivative fiction, and she's not writing as well as uh, Tolkien. She's not writing as well as C.R.S. Lewis. She's just kind of copying. And there are scores and scores of texts, both, both for her and against her, that list and chronicle all the myths and all the narratives and all the terms that she uses in every possible way. Some of them saying there, you see, this is effectively derivative, and others to say, look, with what imagination she reworks these known narratives. Um, but then her agent is accusing the fan fiction of being derivative. Uh, the fan fiction knows very well that it is derivative, that's the whole point of fan fiction, that you want to continue the stories in, that you love because you don't want them to finish, because you think that you, there is something else to say, because you think that there is a new perspective that hasn't been told, because you want to live inside that universe. That is an instinctive narrative that has, I mean really, I'm sorry I keep on sounding like that teapot, but it is really as old as time, and it is really the way in which people have made sense of, of the world. So the fact that now, frankly, what I would, can call nothing else but money, interferes with the possibility of people doing so, because obviously this is what we're talking about. This is a copyright, this is authorship. Now, the fan base of J.K. Rowling is extremely well versed in all the things that I teach, including the death of the author. I have read a lot of discussions about that, which makes, if I were, if I were I'm happy I'm not, frankly, but if I were J.K. Rowling, I would be a little worried about all these people who keep on discussing my death, if only <laughs> as an author with such um, happiness and glee. Why are they happy? Because these are their texts now. And yet she is not letting go. Now, poor woman, she is like, I think she's about my age or something. You know, she, she's nowhere ready to let go. This is her stuff. She has written it and she has written it well. She loves it. She protects it. But on the other hand, it has also been taken. And what are we going to do about that? So, 
what the literary agent implied, and I mean, he said it, I don't know if he was speaking for, for, for Rowling or not, but what he said implies that writers in their own right are those who are writing original content. So we go back to square one. Derivative is the principal accusation, and anybody who is not being original is not writing properly, is not writing the right kind of stuff. But nobody can be absolutely original. If you were completely original, you would be completely also incomprehensible, and you wouldn't be part of a world that is speaking and trying to make sense of itself, which is what fan fiction does. So I think this of fan fiction, I'm coming to the end. Slowly, but oh, I've just turned myself off, or has it just turned itself off? Like it's that? there. It's <coughs> Oh, it's sad. It's just that it's so small and then it can hit. Okay, so this is another contribution of um, Maria Laura Grandolfo, who, as you have understood, I was texting all the time. It's like, <laughs> this thing, saying, oh, what am I going to say? Okay, she sent me this. Hi, Potter and the Secret Gay Love Story. And this is an explanation of why this author started writing fan fiction, what fan fiction meant for them. Um, they have identified a love story that in my three readings I did not see because I wasn't supposed to see it. It wasn't a story that interested me, frankly, and so I didn't see it, between um, Remus and Sirius. And the text explains how that works and in what way it works, and she writes, Sorry, I'm, I don't know why I keep on assuming that it's a woman. Um, uh, I have absolutely no indication of it, but um, the, the, the text suggests that it doesn't matter if it's happening in the text or not, in the original text or not. It doesn't ha matter. It makes a good case that at one point it identifies 40 lines um, in which uh, Remus is looking at Sirius. So it's, there's a the quote that says, Sirius looked at I mean, Remus looked at Sirius, and then lots of other things happen. Forty lines later, Remus turns his gaze away. So he has been looking at him for all that time. Just that's real life. Now I don't. I really couldn't care less if that's true. It's not true. I don't even know what that means. I don't care if it was in the intentions of the author. It wasn't in the intentions of the author because I don't even believe in those. I have a whole world, but I really like this. I like the passion with this, which this text. Um, is written. I like the participation with which it is written. I like the fact that fan fiction readers, because they are so interested in this text, become experts. They learn things. They study things. They do plot analysis, you know, like there were no tomorrow, which not like my students don't want to do that. <laughs> um, they learn this, and that is wonderful. So for me, fan fiction is what I would call uh, mythopoeic. What does that mean? It means that they are making myths. It's not mythical. It is an agency for myth. It is creating new stories. How are new stories created? Because there's a need for them. How is the need created? So we can't always use the same stories. We have to change stories. Why do we change stories? Because things change. I don't know if you noticed that there is a continuous alteration in the state of our reality. And consequently, the old stories are okay as what we were calling Kamavachi, they're okay as broad text, but they're not okay uh, uh, in the detail. And so the detail has to be continuously rewritten. And it's not an aesthetic category. It can become an aesthetic category. Some members of that mythopoeic group will go on to become wonderful artificers of you know, using words in the most fantastic word, way or even other mediums. It doesn't matter. The point is that you can't stop them and you shouldn't stop them by you know, copyright and legal suits from doing so. Because if you do, you have literally put the lid on any possibility for art to do what Marcuse was suggesting to operate on us because We've only got one story, and we know it very well. And so, let me see, where have I done here? I have to go back. Oh, this is going to be one of those things where I get completely stuck. It's at the bottom. Where is it? Yeah? Oh, yeah, there it is. Thank you. 
but it's the second window. What? What is it? Second window that? Yeah. yeah, it's okay. I'll just get to like this. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So this is what I think happens. So we have a story. A story is broken down into what is called nareems. Nareems are the discrete units of narrative. They're tiny, tiny little pieces out of which you can take one and like Lego, you can put again, together again, as you like. And you do, right? So you select, um, one minute, five. <laughs> if someone feels, um, so you select the marines, right? You select them, you adapt them, you circulate them, they can be accepted, they become a narrative, and then you disband them again, and they go back into the ether. What happens if they are not accepted? They go back into the general ether and get reselected maybe 200 years down the line with a different context, with a different meaning. This goes on constantly, and it must go on constantly. And if anything like the culture industry, which has its purpose, as I don't want to have a whole rant against the culture industry, but if something like the culture industry and the undeniable fact that it does tend to narrate a single story is going to interfere with this model, then we have a problem. Um, there have been a few theorists who have started to think of the possibility that the internet might represent a new orality. And uh, as you very well know, it is a system that proliferates in orality for the very obvious reasons that nobody can own a story that is told. You can somehow complicatedly involving lawyers and things claim a story that is written down or that is carved or that has some physical support to it. But if it is just told, it's very difficult to own it. And that is not very different from some things that are happening in some parts of the internet. Not all of them good, but we're finding that that is a reality. And so um, McLuhan was saying that literacy, the visual technology, dissolved the tribal magic by means of its stress on fragmentation and specialization and created the individual, but specialist technologies Detribalize and the non specialist electric technology retribalizes. What does retribalization mean? That we can form new groups, not the old groups, the new groups, because we're loose in the internet. We're lost and loose. Blumenberg says, Hans Blumenberg is my favorite theorist on myth. He talks about the age of oral communication as a phase of continual and direct feedback regarding the success of literary means. Nothing is more unsparing for a text than oral delivery, especially before a public that wants to have a festival and knows how to implement that claim. So what does that mean? That the text gets destroyed. It doesn't say the same. It shouldn't stay the same. We shouldn't be attached only, you know, there are some texts, the sanctity of which we feel like protecting. But if we protect them orally, they're also going to change. And if they change, they're not dead. They're just going to morph into something new. Nothing, um, transmission by word of mouth favors the pregnance of what is transmitted at the expense of precision. And what does that mean? Then it becomes solid. Right? You say it in different ways, but you say the same thing. You don't, can't remember exactly the words for it, but you know what it is that you mean. And so that kind of accumulates a pregnant meaning, literally. Um, in second orality, um, he is identifying uh, what is essentially a more deliberate and self-conscious orality based permanently on the use of writing and print. What does that mean? That we are used, we're writing. We're writing much more than we ever wrote before. But nonetheless, we're writing in a different way, in a more ephemeral way, in a way that doesn't remain permanent because it's, not, it's kind of more detached from all the institutions that legalize our writing. 
And finally, when tellers perform and re-perform a story, some aspects vary, while much remains the same, because the tale is being recreated by surfing along O pathways, oral pathways, which offer options at every juncture. Versions will naturally differ somewhat, even when the same teller is involved, and other factors are relatively constant. Okay, so these are only a few people really, really picked out at random, but who are saying maybe we could consider the possibility of a different kind of narrative, and that different kind of narrative is coming, is not different from what we had in the original phase of narrative before writing. So this is one of the gatekeepers, T.S. Eliot. He took his role very seriously, and he was quite pleased to find the use of myth in James Joyce's narrative. He thought it was quite a good idea to um, reuse uh, myth, as James Joyce does in Ulysses, in order to create order where there is no longer order. He thinks that that's what myth does. Why? Because he thinks that myth is solid. He thinks that myth is unchangeable. Nobody can get dare to go and alter the meaning of Odysseus. It is only one meaning, and it is just absolutely consolidated. And so the chaos of modernity and reality in 1924, 1920s, after the First World War, nobody has language anymore, everybody is devastated by what has happened, you don't know how to write a story, what do you do? You go and take words that have still meaning, and then that makes everything perfectly all right again. And so he says, Mr. Joyce's mythical method is simply a way of controlling, of ordering, of giving a shape and a significance to the immense panorama of futility and anarchy, which is contemporary history. But, and this is my last rather cheesy quotation, Adorno says that the task of art today is to bring chaos into order. And I think that that is what fan fiction is doing, and I'm very happy to see that that is what fan, fan fiction is doing, and I hope it continues to do so until there are no, so many stories that we can't even remember what the monomyth looked like or what the single story was anymore. And I think that Harry Potter, even though you probably are going to say you didn't talk enough about him, but really what I want to see, the reason why I put these two things together is because Harry Potter is what gave an entire generation the idea that they could read something, get really excited about it, really enjoy it, something that was full, full of other stories, chock full of other stories, very freely reused stories, right? Anything that you liked, a funny word, a funny creature, anything could go into that text. What did it teach its readers that you could do that too? And coincidentally, and I don't think Rowling could have known that in 1997, but it so happened that you have a medium in which you can do it. I think that's good news. And that's my talk. Thank you.